I don't think there's any single PC component where you've got quite as much choice and selection as with CPU coolers. With a variety of different sizes, colors, and form factors to choose from, and a huge gap in pricing between the cheapest and most expensive options on the market, which one should you actually pick? Well, in my last CPU cooler roundup, we missed some big names like Thermalright, Arctic, and Noctua. And I'm happy to say in today's update, we've tested literally every single one of the most popular coolers on the market right now to walk you through the options you should absolutely buy in 2025 and beyond. Let's do this. Are you looking to build your first gaming PC but not sure where to start? Well, I've teamed up with Intel to show you how easy it is by teaching my good friend Adam Savage how to build his very first PC, powered by an Intel Core Ultra 9285K. With improved power efficiency and support for the new Core Ultra Boost 200S technology for one-click performance improvements too. You can learn more about the Core Ultra range and watch our video in full at the first links in the description below, out now on the channel. Much like in my other buyers, guide videos for CPUs and GPUs, I'm going to start with some crucial context and explanation about the different kind of coolers that are on offer, how you should go about picking one, and then looking at the results of our performance-based testing. Now, nice and simply, there are three primary ways that you can call the CPU. They are to go for an air cooler, something like this Noctua air cooler is a great example of that. You could go for a liquid cooler, such as this Corsair design here, or you could go for a custom loop design. Now, for the purposes of today's video, we'll be focusing on what we call the closed loop liquid cooler and the tower air cooler. If you're thinking about putting together a custom loop, let's face it, you're probably not watching today's video and that's not a mainstream solution. It's going to cost you hundreds and hundreds of dollars to even get started and is reserved really for enthusiasts. For air coolers, you've got two designs. You've got a single tower and a dual tower air cool design. Now a single tower will try and dissipate heat through the fins on a single tower, while a dual tower will do it with two. The advantage of separating out into a dual tower design is that you're then able to mount multiple fans to drive air directly through both of these heat sinks. A few key metrics to concern yourself with when it comes to the size of tower air coolers is not only the width of the tower and fan assembly, but also the height of the air cooler. If you've got a glass panel on your case, you'll have a maximum height between the motherboard and between the outer glass panel that you'll need your cooling design to fit into. Another key thing to think about is the size of the fans used on the air cooler. The larger the fans, the more cooling capacity you'll tend to go to have. Moving through to liquid coolers and things get, in some aspects, a bit more complicated but also perhaps a little easier to understand. Now a liquid cooler has a fundamentally different way of cooling your CPU. That's because as the name suggests a liquid cooler leverages liquid to keep your CPU cool. By transferring this energy and heating up the liquid you're able to more effectively manage that heat. The liquid is then cooled through the radiator with its series of fins which can be mounted broadly anywhere inside of your system. Now various sizes of liquid cooler exist and the thing that sets these apart is the size of the radiator. The most common type nowadays is 360mm, but you can also get 240s, 280s, 420s, and even small 120 or 140mm designs. Generally speaking, there's no point going any smaller than 240mm. At that point, an air cooler is likely to be not only a more cost-effective, but more thermally efficient solution too. And equally, you probably don't need a 420mm all-in-one cooler unless you've got a really high-end processor in your build that's going to output a lot of heat. You tend to get a bit more of an aesthetic edge with liquid coolers too, as the water blocks on these coolers are often leveraged by brands to create cool unique selling points. Whether that's a cool LCD display of the flat variety or the curved screen we're now seeing from the likes of Trix, or whether it's a digital info display or just some RGB lighting, is something brands are increasingly using to set their designs apart from the competition. Liquid coolers also tend to be a little easier to colour match in your build, with some of the white and black options available tying more closely into the colour scheme, versus of course the slightly more ugly metal heat sinks that you'll often find on tower air-cooled designs. Generally speaking with radiators, the larger the better in terms of performance, but that's not necessarily true for all designs, and some options are more efficient and some options less efficient than others, as you'll see from the testing in a few moments time. I also want to quickly mention about whether liquid coolers are safe. Every time I make one of these videos, I get comments from people saying, what if it leaks? Is it going to damage my components? I've been building PCs here on the channel for at least 10 
years. And over on Geeker PC, which is our UK pre-built website, we use liquid coolers in pretty much all of our builds. And in that whole time, I've only ever had one leak. And on that particular occasion, the cooler leaked onto itself. It stained the tubes of the cooler, but it didn't drip onto other parts. Now that's not to say that the chance of an all-in-one leaking is zero. It's never ever gonna happen. It's incredibly unlikely, but yes, I guess it is a possibility. The likelihood is you're probably going to notice it before it causes significant harm to your PC. And unlike a liquid cooled loop where you've got a lot of human error involved, you're not servicing the pipes or the tubes on these designs anyway. And as such, the chance is very slim. As for popular brands when it comes to cooling, they include the likes of Noctua, Thermal Right, Corsair, and Cooler Master. But we're also seeing lots of newer brands enter the space that perhaps haven't been in that segment before. The likes of Asus have been doing liquid coolers for a few years. MSI and Gigabyte have designs too. And lots of the up and coming case brands like Height have liquid cooled options for good measure. Now, as for which of these are best, that's all going to come down to testing. You'll often find that Cooler Master, who are an OEM or original equipment manufacturer, and actually supply liquid coolers to other brands, will perform better as they assemble their designs with their own tech in their own factories, but that's not necessarily always the case. Asus, for example, have a long-standing relationship with Acer Tech, who make some of the best pumps on the market. And as such, you'll often see Asus designs rank highly on the list for this very reason. Now, before jumping into the testing, I should quickly discuss as well how we test. All of our testing is done with an i7-14700K, because although it's a last-gen CPU, it's known for being quite hot, and that's good when it comes to CPU cooler testing. We test with a range of different thread configurations to try CPU coolers at different scenarios. And it's worth noting that in gaming, you're not gonna be seeing full utilization across every core and every thread. You'll be seeing a lot lower utilization than this. So with that being said, what are the best coolers and what are the results of our testing of an enormous number of air and liquid cooled designs? Well, when it comes to budget air coolers, you've got a couple of good options to consider. Thermal Writer, a new addition to our list, and their dual tower Phantom Spirit and single tower Assassin X Refined 120 SE are both marvellous options. Now Thermorite have done loads of different versions of these two coolers and for air coolers they both punch well above their weight. The Dual Tower Phantom Spirit design is a particular marvel. Here in the UK it's available for in and around the £30 mark and not a great deal more over in the US. For that you get an immense amount of performance. In the Cinebench 4 thread test the Phantom Spirit SE actually beats out MSI's recent core liquid i360, a cooler that costs a tremendous amount more money and sits not far behind the bulk of the 360mm AIOs in our testing. Tune up the core count and it does drop down the pecking order slightly but still retains an amazing position. Here in the 8-thread Cinebench test, the Phantom Spirit 120 SE does lose out to those 360mm MSI liquid coolers mentioned earlier but only by a very marginal 2 or 3 degrees Celsius, sitting alongside a couple of the 240mm coolers that we tested. Again, remember, for a price of around £30, $40. The Assassin X120, which is the single tower variant also performs very, very well. Here beating out the Vectru V5, which is an incredibly common budget air cooler, the Cooler Master Hyper 212 Black, and Deepcool's AG400. The only thing this cooler has against it is the design. It's on the more basic side, and while it will look good in a build, it doesn't give you the fancy lighting or stylistic features you'll get from other designs. Now, I think if you want to spend a bit more money, the dual tower Thermal Right Phantom Spirit shows us that a lot of the 240mm coolers just aren't worth it, given how close they are price-wise to the larger 360mm variants, if you're going to go liquid, you might as well go big. And the cheapest all-in-one liquid cooler I'm going to recommend is the Arctic Freezer 3 Pro. In our Cinebench 4-thread test, the Arctic pretty much tops the charts, with an average of 58 degrees Celsius and a maximum of just 63. Move through to the 8-thread test, and the Arctic Freezer 3 360 Pro beats out pretty much all of the other 360mm coolers once again, with a strong 67 degrees Celsius on average, while finally CPU-Z's 8-thread test does see it sit below a couple more 360mm coolers this time, but still beats out the vast majority of the designs we tested with an average of 69 degrees Celsius and a maximum of just 75 degrees Celsius. Not a bad effort. The only thing I don't like about this CPU cooler is the mounting method, particularly on Intel CPUs. Now, in many respects, the mounting method is both its greatest strength and greatest weakness. You actually have to remove the CPU socket cover and replace it with this integrated Arctic design. This vastly improves contact with the CPU, which is great, but it is a really fiddly process. And honestly, it's not something I believe is all that intuitive for first time builders. The radiator is really thick, which is great, and the fans are high performance, but there's no RGB on this model. To my understanding, the RGB variant is virtually identical, so should perform very similar, but it won't be to everybody's 
tastes. And if you want something a little more out there, I would strongly recommend you look at Montex Hyperflow 360. Again, in our benchmark test, the Hyperflow 360 punches well above its weight. A reminder here before we look at the data, you've been able to buy this cooler here in the UK for around 70 to 80 pounds and in the US for under $100 for a little while. In the Cinebench R23 4 thread benchmark, the Hyperflow 360 sits really near the top of the charts and is actually only beaten out by two or three other 360mm designs, with an average temperature of 58 degrees Celsius and a maximum of 63. That's better than a lot of options from more established brands and beats out a lot of the Acer tech based designs on the benchmark suite too. Impressive. Move through to the 8 thread test and the Hyperflow retains a very similar spot in the ranking. It's beat out by a couple more 360mm coolers this time, with an average of 67 and a maximum of 76. In CPU-Z at 8 thread constant workload, the Hyperflow 360 again holds its own fairly well. There are other coolers that do match it on average, such as the Indorphi Navis F360, but they do so at the expense of a higher maximum temperature. One interesting result as well that I want to talk about here comes from Height's Thick Q60. Now the Height Thick Q60 is a really interesting cooler because it's not actually a 360mm AIO. Now you might be thinking, James, earlier you mentioned that you might as well go big or go home and that ultimately the larger scale of these radiators gives you a lot more performance for relatively speaking, not much more cash. But I should commend Height for their job in building what is the best performing non-360 and non-420mm AIO in our whole benchmark suite. Now Height have done this in a few different ways. They've tuned the fans right up. These are super high RPM fans on the Q60 and the radiator is enormously thick. The radiator on this is actually a staggering 52 millimeters thick, which for context, the Hyperflow 360, which is broadly representative of the rest of the 360mm units we tested, has a radiator thickness of just 27 millimeters. Now what Height have done here is really quite clever. And when it first landed, they were gonna charge you a pretty ridiculous price premium for the privilege. Now I'm pleased to say the Height Q60 only costs around 180 pounds here in the UK, which is still very, very expensive, but you get a much better screen on the Q60 than what you do on some of the other options that we featured here today. I don't want to dwell too much on fancy aesthetic features when looking at performance numbers, but it is worth mentioning here that a good screen and a good piece of software is something that you pay for. In our testing, we really like the Ender XT and Corsair interfaces, though IQ Link still remains a little buggy. And while Valkyrie's recent V360 cooler, which we reviewed very positively over on our website in the card section now, performed very, very well, the software is ultimately what let it down. I also want to talk about 420mm radiators. Now, there are not as many 420mm AIOs on the market as there are 360s, but they are becoming more common. Now, to be clear, they're kind of overkill for anything but the very top-end CPUs. And I think they had more relevance in the last generation where we had really, really high temperatures from Intel's 14th gen CPUs, which we largely don't have with the current Ryzen 9000 and Intel Core Ultra 200 lineup. With that being said, we were impressed by the NZXT Kraken Elite 420 RGB, delivering an average temperature in our four thread test of around 56 degrees Celsius and a very low 62 Celsius maximum, while moving up to eight threads saw the NZXT Kraken Elite 420 top the charts or bottom the charts because it had the lowest temperature. Either way, it had the best result with an average of 61 and maximum of 67. I'm glad to report as well that this pattern broadly continued into the CPU-Z eight thread test. We actually saw pretty much a tie between the Corsair IQ Link Titan RX 420 and ended XT's Kraken Elite. The Kraken Elite was two degrees hotter on the maximum, but still in our view with the other tests I've just discussed provides better performance overall. Finally then, what if you want silent optimized designs? And for the first time ever, we included some Noctua coolers in our testing today in the form of this, the Noctua U12S Redux and Noctua's NHD15, specifically the Chromax Black Derivative, which I think looks a little bit better, but is gonna perform basically virtually identically to the non-Chromax Black version. Now, now, the Noctua air coolers both performed well within their classes, and while the NHD15 was actually beat out in a couple of our tests by other high-end air coolers, it was only done so by very, very small margins. And it is crucially worth noting that the Noctua designs delivered significantly quieter operation than some of the others today. Now, we haven't done a full audible decibel test for all of the coolers on the list, but what I can tell you is that Noctua coolers like the NHD15 Chromax Black performed really well, just 32 decibels at 40 cents meters distance when under 100% CPU load, which was actually lower than some of the liquid cooled options. The pump, of course, can introduce a little bit of noise. And on Montex Hyperflow 360, we measured 47 decibels at that same 40 centimeter distance. So quite a big increase in noise output. So Noctua then absolutely well worth their reputation for silence and well worth
worth considering if you want something that's as quiet as possible. What do you guys think of our test? Do you think they... What do you guys think of, our, of the video and the, the cooler that's now on the table? Get subscribed if you want to see more from us. What PC parts would you like to see us spend like two weeks testing next? Please let me know in the comments below. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.